Hey everyone. So today we're going to write a function that is going to find the nth Fibonacci number. So that's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You know, we have the Fibonacci sequence here. And so if you called Fibonacci of two, for example, you would get this value back. And if you called Fibonacci of, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Eight, etc you would get those values back so pretty straightforward and of course the Fibonacci number is defined as the Fibonacci number of n is equal to fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2 so this is what we're going to be doing let's go ahead and jump right into the actual problem and the first thing that is actually a pretty important thing for us to ask about this question is what is going to be the range of our input values so we're going to take in an integer and x whatever you want to call it and what is going to be the range on this could this number be a hundred could this number be a thousand could it be ten thousand because this is going to affect how we're going to implement this since as you probably know, Fibonacci numbers get very big very quickly. And so if we are going to have our X or our N be potentially larger than 100 or 200, we're going to need to think carefully about how we're actually storing this value since uh, integer or even a long at that point is not necessarily going to be big enough to store the number. So we might have to use like a big integer or something like that. But let's say in this case, I'm going to assume that our n is going to be small enough that it's going to, that we'll be able to store our Fibonacci number in a long. But that's still going to be something that I have to be wary of because normally I'd think of just using integers. And in this case, that's probably not good enough. So it's good to show that you're thinking about what sort of parameter, what are the parameters of the problem and how those parameters are going to affect you because in this case it could have a very real impact so that's really the one big thing we need to confirm with our interviewer now let's talk about how we're going to do this obviously even in the way that this problem is defined it makes sense to do it recursively right we could basically write a function that would just recursively call this and then if we would have our base case would be if n equals 0, then we return 0, and if n equals 1, we return 1, and then everything else, it would just calculate that. But that's not really going to be the most efficient solution, right? Because we're going to end up repeating the same thing over and over again. Because let's say that I call Fibonacci, let's say that I have n equals 5 here. So I have, this is going to be Fibonacci of 4 and 3, and then to calculate these, I'm going to have to call fib of 3, fib of 2. So to calculate fib of 4, I'm going to have to do fib of 3 plus fib of 2. And then to calculate fib of 3, so here, I'll write fib 4 equals fib of 3 and fib of 2. This is fib 5. Then fib three is going to be equal to fib of two uh, plus fib of one. And, but we're going to, in this case, so we have fib of four to calculate fib of four, we call fib of three. And then we also have to call fib of three again. And then each time we call fib of three. So now we've called fib of three twice. We're going to have to call fib of two. And then, you know, it's going to basically, we're going to end up having to do an exponential number of these calls to actually calculate our value. So we could do this much more efficiently by caching our values. And so we're going to use a basically a dynamic programming technique where we're going to actually just cache the values and store them as we go along. So when I come to here and I see fib of three, I'm going to check whether fib of three has already been calculated or not. And if fib of three has already been calculated, then I don't need to recalculate it because it's not going to change. I can just get the value from my cache and return that directly. And then to calculate fib of three, I'm not going to have to call this. It's going to just be a constant time operation. So you can also think about this a little bit like a tree. So we could, for example, we would have our fib of five. And this may be a slightly better way to look at it because it'll be slightly more obvious how we're calling things repeatedly. But then you're going to have fib of four and fib of three. And then on each of these, so fib of four, now we have 
we're going to have to call fib of three and fib of two. And then on fib of three, we're going to, so we're going to have here fib three and fib two. And then here we're going to have fib two and fib one. And then obviously we're looking up the fib one here. So that is slightly a slight improvement in this case but then here we're going to have fib 2 and fib 1 and so on and so forth but you can see we're calling fib 2 repeatedly and we're calling fib 3 twice and so on and so forth so what we're going to do is we're going to have our cache and that's going to allow us to look up the values so let's go ahead and actually think about how we're going to implement this so i'm going to just create a public method called fibonacci and it's going to return a long, right? Because we talked about how we want to make sure that we are creating a large enough uh, sum variable to store our Fibonacci number. And in this case, we're going to assume that a long is a big enough value. So long Fibonacci. And it's going to take in an int x. Then we're going to have... I'm going to implement the, I'm going to create another method that's going to be our method that's going to do the recursion. But here we first, you know, we have a couple cases that we need to handle. So if X is less than zero, that really doesn't make any sense because what does that, like that doesn't mean anything. So I'm just going to return negative one in this case. And that I think is a good way to do it because we know that the Fibonacci number like a Fibonacci number can never be negative one so by returning negative one we're basically returning an error code and I think that makes sense we are going to say if x equals zero I'm going to return zero and the reason for this is that I am going to it's going to make life a little bit easier because next what we're going to do is we're going to set up our cache which is going to be an array and if we have x is equal to zero and we don't just return now then you'll probably see how we could get uh, an index out of bounds exception so it's just going to be easier to do that here and then we're going to have our array which is going to be long a long array because we're storing the fibonacci values so that also has to be long and then i'm going to call it cache and it's going to be a uh, new long and the length of this is going to be i'm going to use x plus one and the reason for this is that i want the highest so we're going to be caching all of these intermediate values right we're going to be caching fib of two fib of three fib of four all the way up to fib of five in this case, which is x. And so I'm gonna be storing all of these values into the array. And so I want to have an array that is going to be the size of all the values that I'm gonna store. And in this case, I know in advance the number of values that that's gonna be, and that's gonna be up to x. And in this case, I'm gonna, just for the sake of a slightly simpler implementation, I'm just going to automate, I'm going to add every value to the cache, including the final return value. So I want the max value of my array to be X. And to do that, we need the length to be X of one. So very long explanation for a pretty simple idea, but hopefully that makes sense. Then I'm going to also initialize my array to be negative one. And that's going to let me know, that's going to give me a way to tell whether the values in the array have been set or not. So I'm just going to do for int i equals zero. Actually, I'm going to do for int i equals one because we know we want to set the first element in the array, the zeroth element in the array to be zero anyway, because that's basically our one of our base cases. So I'm just rather than setting it to one and then resetting it, I'm just not going to set it to negative one in the first place. So I'm going to go from one to uh, cache dot length. So I'm going to do... Uh, I is less than cache dot length and I plus plus and then I'm just going to say cache I equals negative one like that and so that is going to initialize all the values to negative one and then finally I'm going to set my second base case which is cache one is going to be equal to one and as you can see from here now uh, we this is where we would run into an error if x was equal to zero because we would initialize an array of length one and then ca calling or trying to access cache one would give us an array out of bounds exception. So it's that's why we have this line here.
But then finally, we're just going to recursively call our function, which we're going to implement in a second. But I'm just going to return Fibonacci of x and cash. And now we have to actually implement our Fibonacci. So our like recursive function, I'm going to make that private. And that's also going to return along. And I'm also going to call it Fibonacci. And it's going to take in our int x, and it's also going to take in our long array, which is our cache. And so it's going to be able to use the cache, and because we pass arrays by reference, it's going to be able to update the cache, and that those updates will be will propagate across all function calls, which will be useful to us. So we're going to first say we want to check whether our x values in the cache or not because if it's in the cache we don't need to calculate anything so we're going to say if cache x is greater than negative one then we're going to return cache x and the reason for this obviously is that since we initialized everything to negative one if it's not negative one that means that it is it has been set and therefore we can return that value because we've already calculated it and then otherwise we need to calculate it. So I'm going to say cache x equals Fibonacci of x minus 1 and cache uh, plus Fibonacci of x minus 2 plus cache and cache. And so obviously what we're doing here is we're just getting the two previous numbers and if they're in the cache already it'll return those and otherwise it'll calculate them until it hits something that's already in the cache and then finally i'm going to return cache of x and that's all there is to it here like that's pretty straightforward i think it's uh not a super complicated problem we just have to make sure that we're doing all of the caching properly and we have to make sure that we remember to do the caching because if we don't do the caching then obviously it's going to take exponential time because of the amount of propagation of and repeating of the same call over and over again so we let's go ahead and test this so i'm just going to test this on a very simple example i'm going to test this on let's say this Fibonacci number five, which we have from, which we were looking at before. So I'm gonna call Fibonacci of five. And so it's not less than zero, it's not equal to zero. So we're gonna create a cache of length six. So we're gonna say cache equals, and when we initialize it in, they're all set to zero initially. So we're gonna have six values. And then we're going to go through and from one to cache.length, we're going to set them to negative one. So let's do that now and set all these to negative one. And that is six, like we expect. And then we're gonna say cache of one equals one. So that's where we are now. And then we're gonna call Fibonacci on these two. So let's come down here. We have X is equal to five and cache is equal to this. So we'll just say, Say x equals 5 and then we're going to say so cache of 5 is not greater than negative 1 so we're going to come down here and we're going to say cache x is going to be equal to Fibonacci x minus 1 and Fibonacci x minus 2 so first we call Fibonacci of x minus 1 so Fibonacci of 4 and then we do the same thing again it's not in the cache so we're going to call fibonacci x minus one which is going to be, so in this case x equals four then fibonacci of three we do the same thing x equals three we call fibonacci two x equals two and then this time we're going to call fibonacci x minus one, which is one. And so we're going to come here and now cache one is greater than negative one because it's this one here. So we're gonna return one here. So we return one and then we uh, 
are now, so this equals one, and then we also have to do, so we get one is our Fibonacci, so Fibonacci of x minus one equals one. And then we also have to call Fibonacci of x minus two, which is zero. So we again come here, we say cache of zero is greater than negative one and it's zero. So we're gonna return zero, uh, just like that. And then we're gonna set Fibonacci, or we're gonna set cache of two to be equal to the sum of these, right? Because we're taking the sum of the two Fibonacci values and cache two is gonna be equal to the sum of these, which is one. So we're going to set this to be one and we're going to return one from Fibonacci of two. So we're again gonna have Fibonacci of x minus one equals one, and then Fibonacci of x minus two is, and in this case, x is three, so x minus two is one, and so cache one is greater than zero, so we have, and we have the one here, so that's also gonna be, that's just gonna return what's in the cache, and that's gonna be one. So we, come here, we see that Fibonacci x minus one is one and Fibonacci x minus two is also one. So we set Fibonacci three or cache of three to be one plus one, which is two. So now we have that and we return cache x. So we return that again, we have now Fibonacci three is equal to two. We then also call Fibonacci two, which is equal to, we come down here and it's in the cache. So X is two in this case, which is this one, which is one. So we've turned one, we set the cache value equal to three. And then finally, we're gonna do this again and we're going to return three here. We get Fibonacci four equals three. Fibonacci of three equals two. And so we, Return, we set the sum here is equal to five and we return five. And that is, so Fibonacci of five equals five. And that's exactly what we expect as we can see from the Fibonacci sequence up here. And as you saw from us going through it, it was actually quite efficient, right? Because we're mostly just referring to the cached values rather than actually having to recalculate them. So in terms of time complexity here, we can look at what we're doing in, a, in the sense of we only have to actually calculate everything once. So we only have to calculate the Fibonacci value of two once, we only have to calculate the Fibonacci value of three once, and four once, and five once, and so on and so forth. So since we're calculating the Fibonacci value of every number once, and we're going through all n numbers, that means that we obviously are doing this in linear time because we are calling everything, uh, const we're doing a constant number of operations for every incremental, uh, number that we're calculating the Fibonacci sequence for. So since we're do since we're caching everything, we don't have to. For example, once we've done all the caching up to uh, n minus or x minus one, that it doesn't take any longer to calculate the Fibonacci number of x than it did to calculate the Fibonacci number of one. So that was so this way by doing it this way, rather than taking an exponential amount of time, we're doing it in linear time. And obviously the trade-off here is that it does take up more space because we're doing a dynamic programming. So in terms of space complexity, this should be this is fairly simple because we are basically creating our entire uh, memory right here. So we are just doing, this is a directly proportional to the value X. So our space complexity is also of big O of N. And therefore that's, you know, a fairly efficient implementation of our Fibonacci sequence. So that's really all there is to this problem. Hopefully that made sense. It's a pretty popular problem. So maybe you'll run into it in an interview somewhere. And if you have any questions or comments, let me know on the in the comments on the YouTube channel or let me know on the blog or send me an email and I'll be sure to respond. And I look forward to seeing you guys again soon.